to The Late Late Show. On a Friday night in February 1981, 48 young people went out to dance and they never came home. How their lives were taken from them remains one of the most heartbreaking chapters of modern Ireland and the loss suffered by their families remains raw to this day. On top of that, their loved ones have also had to fight for over 40 years for something many of them knew all along, the truth about how they died. Yesterday, that wrong was put right, and I'm delighted to say that we are joined by two women, like so many, who refuse to give up. Would you please welcome Antoinette Keegan and Selena McDermott. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much. Um, Antoinette, if you don't mind, starting with you, I know that going back to that night is, is not easy. Um, what are your memories of that evening? Um, well, Friday the 13th, February 1981, we were all very happy and like looking forward to a great night going out. There was myself, um, my sister Mary, she was 19, my brother John, 17, and my sister Martina, 16, all getting ready to go to the disco competition, the KTEL disco competition. Remember my father that night, um, he kept saying to us, please don't go, please don't go, it's Friday the 13th. And I kind of just like, we be grand, we be grand, I look after them. And we got ourselves ready and, on any particular night going to the stairs, you'd always have to separate yourself from going in when you were going in because if you were in a group, they would actually refuse some of us. So that particular night, um, I think it was Mary and Mary Kenny went in first and then we were way behind on the queue and then we got in. We paid our three pound in um, and that was the admission fee plus um, your supper, which was uh, sausage and chips that night. And Mary didn't drink, and Martina didn't drink, Mary Kenny didn't drink. Um, myself and my friend Helen, we got a glass of harp at the bar, and we sat down, we put our coats and bags there. We said we wouldn't put them into the cloakroom because it was going to be a very, very busy night. So we left them beside us. Um, we got up then and we're dancing on the floor and just meeting people that we knew from school and from like friends of ours that was all up there. And, and when did you realise that, that things were going badly wrong? Well, it was shortly after the disco competition was over. We were back on the floor dancing and I just seen the smoke drifting across the ceiling. I thought it was dry ice from the DJ, the artificial smoke. And then my friend said, look over there. And when I looked over, there was a small fire on the sea. Would have been about 18 inches high. And um, the DJ made the announcement. He said for everyone to stay calm. It's a small fire here and everything is under control. So it looked as though it was a fire that would have been controllable, that it would have been able to put out. But as the fire was getting bigger and the bouncers was trying to put out, the, the back walls start going up in flames and then the ceiling start collapsing in the West Oak Cove. That's when it started getting serious and the DJ made another announcement then for everyone to make their way to the nearest exit. That night, you were pulled from the fire. You were unconscious yourself. Um, you nearly died. Mm -hmm. um, Mary and Martina didn't make it that night. No. Um, uh, tell us a wee bit about them. Well, we, when we were told to make our way to the nearest exit, we went to exit five. And uh, there was a lot of people there trying to get out, and they couldn't get out. So we made our way to the next exit, which was exit four. And as we got, we were about six foot away from the door with the panic of everyone trying to, pandemonium, everyone trying to get out. We were pushed to the floor, but we said we'd hold on to each other's hands so we'd all get out together. So I was holding on to Martina's hand and Mary was holding on to her hand as well, and Mary Kenny, and my other friend, Helen. So we were on the floor, people were trampling on top of us. The whole ceiling was coming down, the fire was all over the place, the lights went down and all you could see was thick black smoke. You couldn't breathe, it was choking your throat. Um, the, the, the whole place was in flames and just like the heat was intense. It was horrible. 
Yeah, her throat was born and the, the thick spoke was choking and he couldn't breathe. And um, then the ceiling started collapsing then, just at the area where I was. Um, my last words was, I just went unconscious and I remember my last words was, oh God, help us. And then I was gone, unconscious. Selena, you were just 11 yeah, for that conscious, night. I mean, yeah. what's your memories of the house before you had your two brothers and your mm. sister went that night? Yeah, it was a um, busy house. Of, I'm the youngest of eight. So um, uh, it was, yeah, it was just a, a busy household. And my eldest sister lived two doors up from the family home. She still lives there. And then my other sister, Breed, um, she, she lived in Rohini with, with her husband. And then there was myself, my sister Louise, um, Willie, George, and my brother Jim. We were still in the house, in living at home. And um, yes, yeah, so like, um, Willie was 22, George was 18, and Marcella was 16. So, yeah. And, and your parents knew that George and Willie had gone, yeah. but they didn't know no, they didn't. That no, Marcella had gone. No, they knew that um, uh, Willie really wasn't going to go to the Stardust, but he changed his mind at the last minute, and he said, "Ah, sure, feck it, man. Might as well go. You know, sure. They're all, all. Everybody's going from the Crescent, and they, they need more and all. You know." And then that was grand. And then George was definitely going because he had a date. Um, and later on, then we recently had found then after through the years that the date was Kathleen Muldoon, who also died um, in the fire that night. He had met her in town beforehand and she was um, training to be a nurse in Dublin. And so they had uh, their big date, you know, in the stars. My mother had bought him a new red shirt for the date. So, um, and then Marcella. Um, God love her, she had told a little white lie, which we all do, like we've all done it, you know, and um, told my parents that she was babysitting with a few of her friends. And, but she told me not to tell them that she was actually going to the Stardust. And I hid her clothes in a bag and her jeans uh, in a little lane way. We, we called it the Alio, you know, it was the Alio, a little lane adjacent to the, the house. So I hid her bag of clothes so, um, yes. Because she, so. she was only 16 and so... Yeah, oh yeah, I did it loads of times for her, you know? And, because uh, she'd bring me into the dandelion market and buy me, like, uh, pin badges for bounds and stuff like that. I was always with her, always with her, you know, so, yeah. And your dad was mm. a fireman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his watch ended up at the Stardust that night, but he... Yeah, D-watch. He, he was off that night. Yeah, he was off duty that night. And um, he had, when he finished work, he had gone for a few pints down in um, the Manhattan in Rohini. And then he had obviously came home. And just when he had got home, um, George was just about to, to leave the house. And he said, oh, great man going to, to start us, you know. But when my dad came in, my dad with a few drinks and him and said, no, you're going, you're going up to the chipper to eat more to get me the fish and chips. And he didn't want the smell of the, the vinegar on his shirt. <laughs> and my ma always remembers that, you know? And my ma said, no, there'll be a row, there'll be a row, keep your dad happy. You know the way it was in households back then, you know, loads of kids. And, uh, and he said, oh, feck it anyway. So he ran up real quick, got the fish and chips and came home. And then he handed my ma a packet of silver mints because she was going to bingo that night. And he used to always buy her something. And he bought, that was the last thing that, that um, he did for my mum, you know. Yeah. You know, just talking to both of you mm. and realising the details of each story mm. and how many stories. Yeah. And this week and the news yesterday, what does it mean, Antoinette, you've been campaigning for over 40 years for this. What, what does it mean to get that result mm. yesterday? It was uh, really, really very overwhelming. It was a, a kind of a, a numbness, like, you know, going around like in the days, like that, it's, is this real? Mm. We finally got it. It was fantastic and unlawful killing because firmly believed that, that should have been done back in 1982 at the very first inquest. Mm. But what was done on us, right, was absolutely terrible, really and truly. We should have never had to wait 43 years, but we got it. We got it, and thanks to our legal team. Mm. They were fantastic, Darren Mack and Felix Law. 
so many families that we are joined by tonight and so many of them packed mm. into that courtroom yesterday. Oh, yeah. So yeah. what was that moment like in court when those words were finally read out? Oh God, it was absolutely incredible. It was, it was, it was nearly almost surreal because um, it was packed, completely packed. And everybody was so anxious and nervous. And, but because even up to, to then, we'd been let down so many times by the state. And it was, but it was always the public people that was behind us and support us. And they wanted to help us, but they, they, like, they didn't know what, other, what else to do. Do you know, did, sure they didn't, Antoinette, no, they no. didn't. They, they were, and that's why in the Truth Campaign, that was their way of signing the cards to say, no, look, it's not just these people, it's the people of Ireland that, that, that are behind us. And um, so, and that's when, like, you know, we couldn't be ignored then from the people of Ireland speaking for us as well, you know? So being in the courtroom was just like, a, it, it was very, it was very sad to, but happy scene as well to see the, the parents that were left and they were, they were sitting at the very front facing um, the corner. And uh, my mother included was one of them. And my mother was afraid that morning when she was going out that her hair, that she, her batteries were, were working in her hair, Nate, because she wanted to make sure that she would hear the verdict, you know? And she heard the and words she that she wanted. And she heard it. And when we just seen her head and her shoulders going down onto the table and she just, it just, she, she cried so much, it just came from inside and it just poured out of her. Yeah. And with the passing of time, so many parents and so many family yeah. members who didn't mm -hmm. get to see I, that exactly. day. Yeah. I know yesterday, Antoinette, you got a phone call from Simon Harris, the new Taoiseach. What did he say to you? Um, he just said, it's like, you know, that um, he'd like to have a meeting with us. And I just said, when? He said, as soon as possible. So I got a phone call then yesterday evening off his secretary to say that he wants to meet us tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So... We're looking for a public apology. We shouldn't have to do this for 43 years. What would an apology from the state mean to you and the rest of the families, Selena? Oh my God, it would mean absolutely everything, but this apology has to be meaningful. It has to be, it has to, it can't be just, um, we're sorry. It has to be very, very, very um, carefully thought out and for it to be delivered to the families. And, you know, and also to the survivors, the survivors as well, you know. Uh, the ripple effect that went through all the families, um, the communities, um, you know, it was just, it, it was, you're, you're talking like, it was, it was chaotic. Um, it was dreadful what happened to us, you know? And, and when you look back as well, Antoinette, if the truth had been given at the time, the pain would never have changed, but your lives would have been different. Our lives would have been yeah. different. Yeah. A lot of the parents would have been still alive. That, mm. that, that the stress killed them, like my poor father. He was only 49 when he died in 1986. Mm. And then my mother, she carried the campaign. None of, none, no mother should have had to have to fight for justice for their loved one. And we should have to, been able to live a proper life. We should have never been given a tribunal of inquiry and a cause of probable larceny being on the record for 27 years. That was totally wrong. 48 victims became insignificant to this Irish state. And it, they're only being acknowledged now because we fought so hard mm. to get what we got yesterday. And the truth has been told. Mm. I know there's so many people that have helped you get to this point, mm. Selena. Is there, who would you like to mention tonight? Um, well, definitely Darren Mackin. Where is he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Darren Mackin and his legal team, they were absolutely phenomenal. And the, all the barristers, they were just, oh my, they were just incredible. Michael O'Higgins, Des Fashi, all of them, they were just incredible. And um, as we've always said as well, the, 
the the big picture of Tankin is is the people, the public people of Ireland. It's the people of Ireland that were behind us all the time that kept saying, don't stop, don't stop, just keep on fighting, you'll get it, you'll get there, you know? Because there's many times that we we felt so um, uh, uh, degraded and beaten and weary and um, and degraded by the state, yeah, you know? Yeah. And we had to keep on pushing and saying, okay, get up again, get up again, come, keep going, keep going. You know, we should, as Antoinette said, we should never have had to do that. The parents should never, her mother should never have, to have done that. The, you know, so. Sorry, there is one more person that we'd like to thank as oh, well, yeah. Lynn Boylan. Yeah. She was fantastic. Yeah. She helped us with the 48,000 mm. postcards campaign. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about Lynn, you're talking about the legal team. Um, on behalf of everyone here and everybody watching uh, across the country tonight, we'd just like to thank you guys for keeping going. I mean, there was no end to your fight for the truth. We also know that there's no end for you and for all the families who've had to live with your loss for so many years. This has always been about your loved ones yeah. and keeping every one of their memories alive. And so tonight, we would like to remember every single one of them this evening. Michael Barrett, Richard Bennett, Carol Bissett, Jimmy Buckley, Paula Byrne, Caroline Carey, John Colgan, Jacqueline Croker, Liam Dunn, Michael Farrell, David Flood, Thelma Fraser, Michael French, Josephine Glenn, Michael Griffiths, Robert Hillock, Brian Hobbs, Eugene Hogan, Marta Kavanagh, Martina Keegan, Mary Keegan, Robert Kelly, Marie Kennedy, Mary Kennedy, Margaret Kiernan, Sandra Lawless, Francis Lawler, Maureen Farrell Lawler, Paula Lewis, Eamon Lockman, George McDermott, Marcella McDermott, William McDermott, Julie McDonnell, Theresa McDonnell, Jared McGrath, <coughs> Caroline McHugh, Donna Mahan, Helena Mangan, James Miller, Susan Morgan, David Morton, Kathleen Muldoon, George O'Connor, Brendan O'Mara, John Stout, Margaret Thornton, and Paul Wade. Rest easy and good night. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for telling that. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really, really good. Thank yeah. Thank you. There you go.